My name is Christy Rich and I teach in the chemistry department. I'm Gail Dupuy. I've been uh, at the University of Louisville since 1995 and I'm in the Department of Industrial Engineering. I'm Gail Crush and I'm in the Engineering Fundamentals Department. My name is Bumi Lee. I'm Assistant Director in Core Activity School of Music, University of Louisville. I'm Julia Cheriker. I'm in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences and I've been here at UofL for I think 11 years now. I'm Dr. Noble. I'm in the Chemistry Department and I've been here since 1984. My name is Penny Howell. I teach in the Department of Middle and Secondary Education in the, Department, in the College of Education. I'm Rhonda Buchanan, and I'm a professor of Spanish in the Department of Classical and Modern Languages. And I also am the director of Latin American and Latino Studies. Ricky Jones, um, professor in the great Department of Pan-African Studies, University of Louisville. I'm Roman Yampolsky. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Engineering, Computer Science at Speed School. It's my fourth year at UofL. I'm Tom Dumstorff uh, from Classical and Modern Languages. Uh, I've been at UofL for, this is my sixth year. Well, you know, one time in a conversation class, I asked all the students, what do you think makes a great teacher? And one of them said to me, un buen sentido de amor. Now, what I think he wanted to say was un buen sentido de humor, a good sense of humor. But it came out a good sense of love. And I really think that the two go hand in hand, that both are correct. Because if you're not passionate about what you do, and how are you going to get your students excited and enthused about the subject matter? I try to have a moment before I go to class that's just for myself. I never would put an office hour before a class because I'm using that time to get everything set up. I'm reviewing what I'm going to do. I do an awful lot of deep breathing. I take my little carrito. I'm famous for my three-tiered cart, which has got the boom box and all kinds of props and, and everything you can imagine on it. And I head off to class. And if I'm lucky, I'm in the elevator by myself. And that's when I say to myself, this is going to be a great class. It's a little pep talk for myself. Try your best to make sure that the technology is going to work before the class starts. I go in, and como están ustedes? And I start right away with uh, asking them how, how they are. The personal touch, always the personal touch. Every time she comes in a classroom, she's always very cheerful, always has a smile on her face. I've never seen her upset before. She's so energetic and really invested in what she teaches that students really enjoy it. One example I remember is the first day of class, she came in, I had never had her for class before, and she just had Argentinian music playing in the background and started basically doing a tango. And it was just so entertaining to watch. And I was saying to myself, I am glad I'm taking this class. I oftentimes use theatrical uh, techniques in the classroom and lots and lots of visuals and lots of props and music to set the atmosphere. All of these things coming together, the multimedia type production makes the class exciting, not boring. Uh, students can never fall asleep in my class. I won't allow it. I do have a water gun in case that would happen. The most important thing that I try to do is create a relationship with the student that is filled with trust and respect. Somehow I just think that's key. That if I can show uh, that student that I see them as an individual and I appreciate who they are and I respect them, that they will trust me. When I tell them to do something hard or something new that they haven't um, done before, maybe a new study technique, that they'll actually do it because they trust that I have their best interest at heart and that I really want them to succeed. It was unreal how enthusiastic she was about the material and you could see her face light up when she was teaching us. You know, she would talk about something and you could tell she'd get butterflies inside, you know, thinking about how interesting this is and how she was really happy to be teaching us that material. But she really wanted us to understand, you know, all these different ways that we can effectively study, not only for her course so that we could do well in that, but also um, so that we could do well in college and our other courses. I think that's what I've most applied from that course. 
So I think our response to the students when they ask the questions is key. I respond in a very interested manner and I, I just try to find the value in what the student is saying to me. And there, there is always value in what they're saying. I think that's reinforcing. The one strategy that I would identify as a foundational piece that makes the courses very successful is from the very beginning is building a community of learners. I do this for two reasons. One is I want to model for the students how to build a community within their own classrooms. And two, it's what we know is that when there's a community of learners that are established in a, an environment that is intellectually, academically safe, that people learn better they achieve more and they're willing to engage more. The first day, the first thing they walk in, um, they take a partner and they interview that person and it's, it's their responsibility then to introduce that person to the class. And so it's not that you stand up and tell about yourself, but someone else has to get to know you enough to be able to introduce you to the class. And then we do groups of four and then we do groups of six so that they're building on each other and learning each other's names. When they're introducing themselves also I ask everyone in the class to write down their name and then something that connects them to that person. So if they say well you know I went to Manual High School. Well if you went to Manual High School then that's your connection to that person and I talk about how those those tiny connections build the larger connections which build the fibers of that community. What we didn't realize, we didn't think about, is how many students will be um, struggling readers. And what one of the things that she did was she gave us um, examples of how like, we can help the students who are struggling readers. She gave us this worksheet of letters that were all jumbled up in paragraph form. And we were looking at it like, what is this? You know, what are we supposed to do with this? And she had questions we had to answer about it and we just like we don't know how to do this and she was like yeah this, that's how struggling readers feel in the classroom. We value each other's perspectives and opinions there we ask about them and connect to those and so all of those pieces come together to validate each person's contribution so if they say something that contributes to the conversation then we can say I'm connected to that by so that validates that and brings them into the community. At first, they're just trying to keep up with the, you know, the subject material. They're interested in, in getting their homework done and, and doing well on the tests, which are all important things. <laughs> but by the end, I think they really sort of see the, the bigger picture. They, they really know that they're going to have to apply these techniques out in the real world. They're interested in, in how uh, the, the skills that they've gained here this will translate into the, the professional world, combining uh, methods and techniques that they've learned in a variety of classes. I want them to know what the, to do, or at least at the start of what to do, why they're, that's the right approach, and then how to interpret the results at the end. Usually she, in our class she always will go over the abstract concept and here's kind of the theory and here's the math behind it. But really what she wanted to talk about was what are the real life applications, so what are you going to find in industry out there um, that you can use this information to help you solve problems. Uh, so she would always have two or three examples um, of things that she had done or um, other case studies and she would go over those and she would always ask the students whether or not that they understood that, um, the material and if not then we would stop and we would go over that material until everyone understood it. Many of our students learn by example and so they, they like to hear these examples of applications in a variety of different settings. I think they enjoy the idea that the work that they're doing is actually helping people. I'm most proud of integrating research and education. As soon as the students are capable of doing any type of serious level work, usually by second, third year, I give them real world problems. The assignments I give them are actual research 
problems which if they succeed at solving, we publish papers. Last semester we published three papers based on student homework assignments. Journal papers, conference papers, workshop papers. It uh, really gives students a uh, boost in the self-esteem. They don't know it's a real problem. They think it's a homework problem I made up. Later on they realize, hey, no one came up with this solution before. When I firstly start uh, as to, to, to select my research uh, area, I mean, I, I didn't have uh, uh, an, an idea or I mean what should I work and he gave me the, the starting point of my research and uh, like he put me in the first step how to start and go ahead and he always like directed me toward achieving my, my final goal. If you give them a problem and tell them it's a very difficult problem, no one knows how to do it, they're gonna fail to solve it obviously but if you don't tell them exactly how hard it is, just tell them it's a homework assignment it's due next week maybe one of them will manage to solve it. There are lots of examples in history where well-known unsolved conjectures were solved as homework assignments. I always try to work on the most difficult problems because if they succeed completely, it's going to be very impressive. want them to be able to think like a scientist and say, do I believe this? Why or why not? I'll often ask them a question that really is the third question in a series of questions. And they have to be able to ask themselves the first two questions and identify those questions as needing to be asked to answer my question. So when I can ask that kind of question and they can give me an answer and I can say, now tell me how you reasoned your way there and they can go through the steps, that, that metacognitive process. One of the things I remember most in um, our 527 class, she made us all write down something we didn't understand on a post-it note, and we all had to go put it in like the parking lot that was the you know, whiteboard. And we were all just like, oh gosh, this is like elementary school stuff. But it was really helpful because then she went through each one of those, and the next day in class she was like, okay, these are the things y'all aren't getting. And we went over all that stuff that we weren't getting. I think to be effective, especially if you want not only for them to learn chemistry, but also train them how to be a chemist and actually do the work, you have to be able to kind of put yourself out there and let them see how your mind works too. And I often tell students, this is the way I approach solving this problem, but this may not be the only way. And sometimes we'll explore and I'll make them explore how they are solving it. I trust people and then when I when I show that my trust for that, they always give back to me that trust even bigger than what I gave. That's so incredible. I normally say right after rehearsal, some section, I'm just trying to give really good compliment. Even though they're like hit the wrong notes, they just hit the wrong section, but still good, good. And then let's make it better. I think you can do that. I trust you. Let's just have fun. Let's just enjoy what we're doing. The most interesting thing about her is the humility that she has when teaching because never at any time do you feel like she's sort of telling you what to do because this is what you do. She's just so good at what she does and wants you to share in that with her. On the stage and on concert, that's so fantastic because after entering the stage, and then I just came to stage. After ball for the audience, I stand on the podium, and I start, I just watching their eyes. There I say like, here we are, we are ready. do a unit, have an exam over that unit, and then they get their exams back the next day. So they see what they've missed. We start the next unit. But at the end of that second week, they're going to get an exam over that second unit as well as an exam over the first unit. 
if they did not understand a concept that they got tested on previously, they have a chance to go back and learn it and then show in the second exam that, oh, I've got it now, I can do this, which is really an ideal model because it gives them that chance to improve their exam grade for a unit. And that continues on through the whole semester. All the engineering students are required to have a tablet and that tablet comes with the software, but one of the products that we use is Dino. It's a very nice tool because it allows the students, if they don't understand, they can let me know they don't understand without identifying themselves. They can simply click on a button that says, I understand well, I don't understand so well, or I'm really lost. And if I see a red flag, you know, that means somebody's really lost out there. I need to reevaluate how I'm presenting this material. She was really open to helping you. If office hours, non-office hours, you could just drop in, be like, I really don't get this. She could break it down in different ways. She could explain it once to the entire class in the way that maybe majority people would find it easier. But then she could also sit down and be like, okay, well, what about this? And show you a different way to solve it that maybe it wouldn't click with other people. But then for me, it was something that would click. There's a sense of satisfaction that they exemplify when they do get it. When they don't get it, I see a lot of frowns. They'll tilt their head a little bit and look at that. Or I'll be moving on, they're looking at something else, and it's like, hmm, we need to back up. It's a matter of just reading their expressions more than anything. I'm always reaching into my, my bag of personal experiences because I, I have this ability to remember like moments where I learned various words and expressions and more often than not they, they involve some sort of humorous or interesting story. So I'm always trying to, to relate not only you know, uh, from their, the side of their side personally but from me as well. So by the end of the day you know, they know so much about me more so than probably they need to and I know a lot about them. That's what makes it you know, interactively fun. In order to encourage success in a, within a student, you have, to, you have to be able to put yourself in their shoes. Always be able to take into consideration uh, the student as far as their, their personal situation, their, what they're bringing to uh, uh, the table as far as is what keeps them from maybe making it to class on time, or what keeps them from, from doing the homework, or what keeps them from being able to remember, you know, 20, 30, 40, a couple pages worth of vocab or expressions and stuff. I think one of the things I love about Dumpstore's ability as a teacher is that when you come to the classroom, it's not so much a rigorous course where you're learning Russian. It's just a conversation table, and uh, even if you make a mistake, you know, he's not there to criticize you or uh, chastise you. He's just there to help you and help further your knowledge of the language. I remember that the hardship that I had uh, as an undergraduate, I mean, I, I flunked out of school once. You know, I, put, I just put myself in their place and try to encourage them, you know, you know, at the moment of failure or, you know, lack of any great success that, that this isn't that this isn't the end of the world because, you know, you always you know, have the opportunity to, to pick yourself up and, and start again. Open yourself up. Be vulnerable and open enough to know that you can learn from your students and let your students know that. So then they're gonna feel like they're participants in this, you know, your partners. It's not, you know, such a, a, a vertical thing. It's more horizontal at times. You can't lose control of your classroom, obviously, but the, the students have got to understand that you're a human being who can learn too, and you got to understand that you can learn too. Then you'll let them talk, you can learn from them. You know, being a mentor is a very different thing than being a teacher. Now you, you push your mentees harder than, than you even push, you know, students in, in general. And this is a little bit different for me too, and I have to say this because I'm a black male, and most of my mentees are black males. That is really an endangered population of people in higher education. You look at this country, quantitatively, we got more black males in jails and prisons and somehow affiliated, associated with the criminal justice system than we do on the campuses of colleges and universities. So for these young men, many, many of whom are coming in just like me, you know, without fathers or father figures, coming from rough neighborhoods, whole nine, I'm not just talking to them about the classroom. What he instilled in me and what he taught me was uh, that 
I mean, I could do great things. I remember one of our first lectures was on uh, epistemology and basically how you know what you know and um, telling us to always ask the question, why? And that, for me, went into a poem that I ended up writing called Epistemology, which later evolved into a book without, you know, him telling me you could do it. It's like you are, you know, the expectation of greatness. I dedicated it to him and a couple of the other instructors who kind of inspired some of the thoughts that went into it. But it would not have even been a thought in my mind if not for um, some of the lectures that Dr. Jones had. I don't just teach, I study my teaching. So I've been around long enough. I have lots of statistics. I know where my students have troubles. It's an evolutionary process where you're taking the feedback from the students. Some of it's verbal, some of it's simply how they do on the exam. And you're incorporating that, you're changing material. The lectures I do today are not the lectures I did five years ago. There's significant modification. You have to keep touch with the students and find out what's working, find out what's not working, get rid of what's not working. I analyze every question on the exam and how well it does. So I know which questions are gonna bomb, I know which questions are gonna do well. Pretty much, you're not 100% accurate, but okay, so the material I'm doing well, I don't have to spend that much time on in lecture. The material that is not doing well, I incorporate more examples into the lecture. So trying to drive it home a little better, or the stuff that they're just not getting, and to me is not real important, I just can it. When we were in lecture, um, it was as if he was teaching to every single individual student, as if that one student was the only person in that lecture room. He made time for all the students. He's in his office every single um, day in the morning. There is so much time that he spends trying to help his students and trying to help them understand chemistry. Chemistry is somewhat esoteric for a lot of people, but when you can tie it into normal everyday stuff, that kind of generates a little more enthusiasm. Dr. Jambolski, thanks a lot for everything you've done to me, and uh, I hope that we finish what we have started uh, very soon. Dr. Dupuy, thanks so much for being in, more involved um, uh, in my career as a student. Um, I've had a lot of teachers that don't know my name, and you know my first name, you know my last name. Just making your classroom fun and enjoyable to go to, and something you can look forward to every day. To say thank you to Dr. Rich, I would probably just say thank you. There's no way I could express my feelings, you know, in a certain amount of words that would tell her how much she meant to me. Thank you, Dr. Buchanan, for everything you've done for me as a mentor, as a professor, and I really love going to your office and talking to you, and it's just, I always have a smile on my face at the end of the day when I talk to you because you really help me and you're very patient with me. Thank you for all of the individual times you helped me, um, all of the times that me just personally, I needed your help and you're always there for me. Thank you for all the extra hard work. Thank you for the for answering my emails um, in such a detail. Thank you for spending nights with me when I didn't understand you know, a certain topic. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for being a great and um, wonderful teacher, passionate about what you're doing. You helped me so much, more than just calculus. You, she was someone there if I was stressed that I could go to. I just thank you for taking uh, a more involved role in my education. <laughs>